Welcome to part one of the lecture on Ronald Dworkin and his critique of positivism. In this lecture, we will go over the introduction to the critique of positivism by Dworkin, the interpretative approach to law, Dworkin's work and criticism in taking rights seriously, especially chapter two to five, uh, discussion of law as integrity. We will also go over Hart's response to Dworkin in his postscript and the discussion of principles and rule, and also the debate on policies and principles. We will also go over the rights thesis and go over the discussion on Judge Hercules. So let's begin by the introduction to his critique. Positivism has been identified with the thesis that validity of laws depends upon their sources and not their merits. A particularly powerful model for this approach is provided by H.L.A. Hart's conception of every legal system having a rule of recognition, establishing criteria by which standards can be identified as legal standards. The rule of recognition of a particular legal system identifies the sources of law which are valid in that system, for example, legislation, precedent, and laws are valid in accordance with the rule of recognition. Laws are valid because they either belong to one of those sources or are validated by other laws which do, for example, delegated legislation. The idea that the validity of a legal standard depends upon its sources rather than its merits is not an uncontroversial one, since many legal standards in both private and public law seem to derive at least part of their force from their intrinsic merits. For example, no one is to profit from their own wrong. No one is to be a judge in their own cause. Now, the question is, how is positivism to account for the status of such standards, often described as quote-unquote legal principles? And this is where Dworkin differs. Dworkin claims that positivism cannot and that principles show that law is not necessarily source-based. Many positivists, on the other hand, think they can, since laws can specify moral conditions for the validity of other legal standards. For example, laws which talk about inhumane and degrading treatment, de treatment or laws which talk about unconscionable conduct. The question then is, does this deal adequately with the problem raised by the existence of principles. So far as Dworkin's critique of positivist account of validity goes, the original argument merely claims that the positive, positivist account is inadequate, which leaves the question, what alternative account of legal validity is there? This is the challenge to which Dworkin responded in his work on hard cases. Dworkin argues for a much more liberal conception of the scope of legal considerations than positivists. For Dworkin, law encompasses not only code decisions and legislations considered discreetly, but the totality of law as seen internally coherent and consistent set of individual rights and duties. Law has to be seen as an enterprise with underlying values which inform its content and interpretation. But does this work? or does it make any type of consideration which a court relies upon in reaching its decision a legal consideration? Does it obliterate the idea that courts rely on both legal and non-legal consideration in deciding cases? So let's talk about Ronald Dworkin and his interpretative approach to law. Dworkin believes to resolve legal disputes, courts often need to interpret sources of law such as constitutions, statutes and precedents and they also need to interpret the communications by which parties try to order their own and others' legal rights and duties, such as leases and wills. Is interpretation a technique for dealing with uncertainties and controversies as to the effect of such legal instruments, or does it take the interpretation to answer any question of law? Is legal reasoning a form of interpretation, or is it a form of reasoning that requires interpretation? Ronald Dworkin argues that law is an interpretative concept, by which he means that any true statement of law is true because it follows from the best interpretation of the legal practice of the community. We will consider Dworkin's claim that all questions of legal rights and obligations, as well as what he calls hard cases, are to be answered by interpreting the community's legal practice in a way that shows that that practice to respect the rights of the members of the community. 
We will now consider Ronald Dawkins' book, Taking Right Seriously, especially chapters 2 to 5, in which he criticized positivists like Hart. So, Dawkins in this book says that a descriptive account of law is useless. It only looks at the law from an external perspective as, and is incapable of truly understanding law from the point of view of the participants. Please do note that the descriptive account of Hart does take into account the internal point of view, as Hart does point out in his postscript. Dworkin states instead that useful theories of law must be interpretative. One must adopt an interpretative attitude. This involves inter alia bringing political convictions to bear on the relevant data. It follows that legal theory must always be politically committed. There is no room for value-free theorizing of the kind set forth by Austin, Kelson or Hart. Hart responds that the way participants respond to the law can be recorded as a fact within the descriptive approach. Descriptions may still be description, even when what is described is an evaluation. Dworkin also criticizes positivism's claim that value-free theories of law can exist. He says that they may be denying the need for interpretative attitude because they say that we know what law is simply by attending to the way in which people use the word quote-unquote law. Dworkin calls this the semantic sting. Now this would mean, according to Dworkin, that when people disagree about law on any topic, they are disagreeing about questions of the linguistic usage. And that would be such a silly view that Dworkin charitably recasts positivists as theorists who take up the interpretative attitude, but the wrong one, conventionalism. Dworkin also talks about laws having integrity. Why don't we have checkerboard laws? That is, those that treat people in the same situation differently. For example, why don't we make abortion legal on even years and illegal on odd years if the population is evenly split as to the legalization and each person has an equal impact on the system? The checkerboard would surely be fair as it allows the views of all the people to be taken into account and reaches a compromise. Similarly, it is just since a person who is opposed to abortion may consider a checkerboard solution more just than full legalization. He says the reason is integrity. That is that the law must take a decision and justify it on the basis of the principles that it considers correct. A checkerboard compromise undermines the principles for taking a particular decision which integrity demands. So adding on to the integrity point, Dworkin says the best politics and that which therefore is used by the courts etc. is that of fraternity quote unquote. That is shared responsibility for actions concerned for all equally. This standard of integrity turns community force into law. Thus there is a, there is a fundamental right to be given equal concern in the construction of law which means giving everyone basic rights. Cottrell commented that Dworkin says that because the law is based in community, all participants of the community who accept its basic values of integrity, etc., are as entitled to interpret the law as judges. Therefore, people are entitled to act according to his own considered and reasonable view of the law, since community members are duty bound to obey the true interpretation of law, not one person or one's judge's interpretation of it. This is the basis for civil disobedience. Dawkins is criticized here for three reasons. One, who will determine anarchy? Not the court, since clearly Dworkin sees them as having more, no more right to interpret the law than anyone else. Secondly, this would lead to complete anarchy. Nobody would follow laws which they consider not to have integrity, quote unquote. And three, it doesn't really happen and is therefore invalid as a description of our system. People do follow court orders even when they think the court has got it wrong. Submitting to the court decision is not voluntary. Dawkins says that the point of law is to justify coercion. Hart denies this in his postscript and points out that much of law is not concerned with coercion, rather concerned with things like power conferring rules. Dawkins also denied the positive solution to where laws run out or hard cases that judges have a strong discretion to make law and instead says that judges have no discretion. They are in fact 
bound by principles. We will now consider Hart's concept of law chapter 7 and the postscript in which he responds to Dworkin and some of his criticism. So Hart says that sometimes cases are indeterminate, that is the law is open textured, for that, is, that means hard cases. Obviously there must be discretion in such cases because we are quote unquote we are men not gods and therefore cannot determine the outcome perfectly in uncertain cases. All legal systems have a tension between the need for certainty and the need to leave the law open whether for fairness or for future development. The codes according to Hart have a role producing function in uncertain cases. Rule skepticism is therefore valid in hard cases. Now Dworkin rejects this and this rejection is approved by Cottrell as well who says that Dworkin is right that there is no room in common law for strong judicial discretion as the code's purpose may be creative but it is not legislative. Cottrell says that Dworkin explains the constructive interpretation by analogy to a writer continuing a story that was started by earlier writers. The style and storyline must fit, but within the possible options that fit, he must select the best option. Now we will end our discussion on Dworkin for this part of the video right here. In the next video, we will go over the remaining reply by Hart to Dworkin in his postscript, consider the debate of rules versus principles, policy versus principles, Dworkin's rights thesis and his discussion of Judge Hercules. For part 2 of the lecture, notes, summaries and further material to aid and complement your lecture, please log on to lawprep101.com. Remember, don't just study hard, study smart.